It is sometimes stated that the ingredients of a combination should determine the price of it. And while this kind of goes into it a little bit, I don't think that it's accurate and it's not reflective of what actually happens in the hobby. So when you are looking at double recessive projects, the Desert Ghost Clown is significantly more expensive than an albino clown. And the reason why is that the Desert Ghost Clown has way more demand for it than an albino clown does. And you can go through all of the different factors that determine demand, and all of them are significantly higher for the Desert Ghost Clown than they are for an albino clown. And it's not about how necessarily difficult it is to hit an animal, even though the difficulty of an animal helps deter helps keep the supply of it low. The reason why prices rise and why there, some animals, some projects are more expensive than others is because there is a higher demand for them. Hey friends, it's Steven with Leviathan Snakes. And for this week's video, we're gonna be talking about something that's just a little tiny bit controversial, but it is the price of various different ball pythons and ball python projects. So we've gotten a couple different comments at various points in time about people who are upset about ball pythons or specific kinds of ball pythons being more expensive than what they feel like they should be for various different reasons. So we wanna talk about what factors go into determining the price of a ball python and kind of get into some common misconceptions when it comes into what determines the price of ball python morphs. So we hope you enjoy the video. If you do, please like, comment, subscribe, and let's jump into it. For this video, we are gonna be talking about various different factors, but a lot of it is going to be underpinned by the economic idea of supply and demand. And a lot of people have heard of supply and demand before, so we're not gonna really get into like all of the nuances of supply and demand, but I do wanna talk about one misconception that I think happens fairly commonly, and that is that people think that supply and demand are influencing each other. And while they may indirectly influence each other, the idea of supply and demand when it comes to economics isn't talking about the relationship between supply and how that affects the demand, or the idea of demand and how that affects supply. It's talking about how supply and demand affect price of something. So that's what we are gonna be talking about is how supply and demand affect price, and then kind of why this determines the various different price threads thresholds for ball pythons. So as a super summarized idea of supply and demand, it is saying that if there is an imbalance between the supply and the demand for a product, then the price of it is going to change. And I say that it's going to change because it may go up, it may go down, depending on the exact imbalance that's in place. So again, at a very, very basic generalized level, if you have a demand for a sunset ball python and the demand for a sunset ball python outstrips the supply of it, that is going to create upward pressure on the price and it's going to subsequently increase the price of sunset ball pythons as more supply becomes available. And the inverse, if you have an overabundance of supply of sunset ball pythons and there's not enough demand willing to pay the price for the sunset ball pythons, that's gonna create downward pressure on the price and ultimately the price is going to fall. So when it comes to ball pythons, we're gonna talk about like just ball python projects in general. At the very, very beginning of a project, there's a very, very small number of animals that are in existence if available at all. So in the idea of supply and demand, this means that there is a very small supply, but that does not necessarily mean that there is a demand for it because it's not saying that there is a small supply of something and therefore it is really, really valuable and it's really expensive. Instead, it's saying that there has to be an imbalance. There has to be more demand for that product, or in this case, that morph, than what the supply is to satisfy the demand. And if there is, then the prices can go up. So if you are, let's say, starting a Dinker project and you prove out that it's genetic, but nobody knows about the Dinker project, you might only have two animals available, but that does not necessarily mean that it's going to get $20,000 for those two animals because there is not an established demand for it yet. So you actually, in this specific situation, have an imbalance. You have an oversupply because you have two animals and nobody wanting to buy them. So therefore that's creating downward pressure on the price. So 
When it comes to ball pythons, we are going to assume that a project has some level of demand for it, so that way we can kind of talk about the rest of the factors. And when it comes to demand, I think that there are five different factors that go into creating the demand for a product, or in our specific example, a morph for a ball python. The first factor that goes into generating demand for something is awareness. So in order for people to have a demand for it, for order for people to want a product, they have to know that it exists. And in order to generate awareness for ball pythons, really the only main way that you can learn about a morph or learn about a project is through marketing. So animals that have really, really strong marketing support behind it or projects that have really, really strong marketing support behind it are probably going to have more awareness within the community than a project that has just started and it's just one individual breeder who's doing it in their spare room and isn't posting it on social media, nobody's really talking about it because there's so little awareness for that project, it is really, really hard to generate a demand for it when nobody knows that it exists. So if you have a project that has a lot of demand or has a lot of awareness, that is the first factor into increasing the demand for it. Let's say that people know about a project. That does not necessarily mean that it's automatically going to have a massive demand for it because they may see a morph, a brand new morph, and everybody knows about it because it was blasted out on social media and at least everybody's talked about it, but nobody think that it thinks that it looks good. Nobody is interested in what's happening with that project. That interest is the second factor in generating demand is people have to be curious about it. They have to be like engaged so that way when they see it, when they hear about it, they're like, oh, that's really cool. That looks awesome. I'm really excited to see what would happen if you put this new project in with Mahogany or if you put this new project in with Desert Ghost. I think that those two will look really, really good with this new project. That interest, that curiosity that is peaked is critical for generating demand at all, a period, because you are going to be able to capture the audience's attention once you make them aware of it. And then once you capture their interest, they are going to start thinking about the project and potentially wanting to buy it. The third factor that goes into generating demand for a product or project in this case is the idea that that project is going to somehow have the potential to solve a pain point that the user has. So if you are a breeder, a lot of times one of the pain points that we're gonna say is you want to be able to make amazing, beautiful new combinations of genes that other people haven't hit before. So the idea of a new morph is potentially solving solving that pain point of being able to create new combinations. Now, the thing that comes into this is, is that new morph wildly different than what's already on the market? Because if you are creating a new combination, but it looks exactly like a combination that already exists, even if they are technically different morphs, it's not really gonna have a whole lot of potential. So when it comes to ball python projects, ball python projects that as a single gene morph or a, the homozygous form of the morph that the project is based on is wildly different than anything else that is available on the market, it is going to have way more potential than a gene that is very, very similar to genes that already exist on the market. So this wildly difference is going to provide the potential that you can make wildly different other combos that will look really, really good if you can find out the exact combination of genes that unlock all of the potential. The fourth factor that goes into the demand is the perceived prestige of buying into that product or that project or that product. So if it comes to a ball python project and you have, let's say a sunset, because the price of sunset is so high and people who are in the sunset project often are the like leaders of the reptile industry. So this is like Canova, this is always evolving pythons. These are various different people like that. 
it increases the prestige of the project. So if somebody like us were to buy into a project that Canova and Always Evolving Pythons, Brock Wagner, Brad Boa, all of these different people are invested in already, it kind of lends a little bit of that prestige to us because it shows that we're working on a level that's maybe not the level of Canova or anything like that, but we're working with animals that they are also working with. So that prestige is really, really important when creating demand. So if you are looking to get into a project that doesn't have any of the notable people within the industry supporting it, it's going to be very, very hard to try to increase the prestige of that project in order to get the very, very high expensive prices that kind of come from when you have a really, really high demand for a project. The last one that I want to talk about is actually something that can drive down the demand for a project, and that is the perceived risk of it. So with all of this stuff, a lot of times when people are breeding ball pythons, they are looking to create amazing, cool new combos, and they're also looking to get a return on the money that they have invested in them. So if there is a high risk that the person won't be able to achieve one of those two things or both of those two things, it's going to drive down the demand. And you can see this when it was the scaleless project with the desert project, because what ended up happening is as there was all of this potential with these new morphs and completely scaleless ball pythons and a gene that was like Desert Ghost, but it was incomplete dominant. It provided a lot of potential. It provided a lot of prestige. There was so many different factors driving up the demand for these. But when the information came out that both of these different morphs had problems specifically with the females, it drove the demand down because it drastically increased the risk of joining that project. So if you joined, let's say the scaleless project, and you made a scaleless animal, and that scaleless animal was a female, you were pretty much at a dead end because there, as far as I'm aware of, it's been like well over a decade and there's never been a scaleless female who has laid a clutch of eggs. So essentially that is saying that if you are working a project to breed and make new combinations, that you're running the risk that half of the babies that you are ultimately wanting to make will not be able to reproduce and that kills the end of the project or that, that kills the project right there. So because of that, the risk drastically increased and because it drastically increased, the demand fell for that project and because there was such an oversupply of it, the prices crashed for those projects. So now that we've gone through the five different factors that determine the demand for a project, which is awareness, interest, potential, prestige, and risk, we want to talk about like how this influences the supply. So at the beginning of a project, you are having the founder who has maybe one or two animals, just a small amount that they have produced and kind of proven that a project is genetic. And we're gonna assume that they've proven that it is wildly different than all of the other projects, all of the other morphs that are currently on the market. So what ends up happening now is that they need to get people to adopt the project. There is a small number of people who potentially may want this project because they see that it has potential, it's been proven that it's genetic, and hopefully there's been enough work done through breeding to prove that there isn't risks of having maybe the super form being a lethal combination or that the females and the males aren't able to reproduce. Pretty much you determine that there is little risk to joining it from a genetic side, health of the animal side. So what ends up happening is you get a couple of the early adopters. Depending on exactly who who you get as the early adopters will influence things like prestige. Because if you get, let's say that you are a new breeder and you get your friend who's also a new breeder and neither one of you have very big names within the hobby and you are both working this project, it's not necessarily adding a bunch of prestige to it. But at the early stage, an early adopter, if you're able to get somebody who is very, very well known within the hobby to start supporting it, it is going to increase the prestige. So as more people are working it, the supply is coming up and there's getting some that are available. The kind of sweet spot that I believe that happens is when you are getting something, getting a project that is obviously different, it is obviously cool and people like it, even if not every single person likes it, and you're able to get the trendsetters on board. 
So when you get the trendsetters on board, they start essentially using word of mouth marketing to talk about the project and continually continue to raise awareness for the project. And as awareness is raised and interest is peaked and more and more people get excited about it and more and more people see the potential, the demand keeps going up and up and up. And at the early stages of a project, the demand will far outpace the supply because ball pythons only lay a clutch maybe once a year. And when they do that, maybe you're gonna get a big clutch and get 10 eggs. Let's say you're getting like six to eight eggs on average. So every single year for every single animal that's available, you're only getting like maybe, and this is assuming you don't hold anybody else, anything back from it, maybe you're getting five to eight animals, or five to eight new people who are getting into the project every year per animal that is working it, or per female that's working the project. So all of this to say is that it's very easy for the demand of a project in the early stages to outstrip the supply. And when that happens, it creates a lot of upward pressure on the price. Over time, more and more people get into the project. And as they get into the project, they start breeding those animals that they have bought and they've invested in. So when they're breeding those animals, it is increasing the supply. And realistically, the demand for the project is probably highest when all of the trendsetters are getting into it and they're showing it off on their um, in their projects. So by the time that the majority of the breeding population is getting into a project, the prices are gonna start falling faster and faster because the supply is outstripping the demand. The people who were interested in the project have already bought their animals, so they're producing their own animals. They don't need to buy new animals. And because of this, I think that there is a danger of getting into a project that is really, really high end, high, um, you have a risk of getting into a project that's really, really high end, really expensive, once you notice that pretty much everybody that you've talked to already has the project. So if they all already have the project, it's gonna be a little bit harder to sell animals in the future because they already have theirs and why would they buy a new animal when they can just make it themselves? So in order to stay ahead of those projects, you have to find ways to combine in genes and look and essentially establish a new project. So if you were working on the Sunset Project and you notice that by the time that you get into the Sunset Project, everybody else is already into the Sunset Project, you may end up deciding that, okay, I don't wanna make just sunsets, I wanna make sunsets with other genes in them. I wanna make sunsets with a, another, another recessive in it, so that way all together they're making new things and establishing new projects and paving the way forward. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please like, comment, subscribe, and we will see you next week.